uh, it's really interesting how God takes a group of people that are that are misaligned and, and different, multi ethnicity, a multi diversity, multi understanding, and and through the power of His transformation, when His Spirit comes to live within us, He brings us together into a family. And, and I want to talk to you about that. What does that look like to really live? in the family of God. But before I get that, I need to tell you some things about Greek culture that Paul was writing to. That when you look at scripture, you always have to look at cultural context. To whom was Paul writing? And it really comes to us because we deal with some of the same stuff culturally. Now, here's the thing. There are probably no greater uh, prejudice or racial people in the world than the Greeks. Now, the Jews were bad. They said, we're the chosen people of God and Therefore, our morality, our view of life, everything was superior, and they had segregated themselves. Now, the Egyptians, another kind of culture there, they basically said this, we're the Egyptians, and we're excluding everyone else. Everyone else serves us, and we're kind of the dominant upper class. Um, we kind of see that in America today with the super rich. We're the upper class, and everybody else serves us. It's a little bit of the Egyptian vibe. And then the, um, the Jews were, were segregated, we're better than, we're not mixed, we don't marry. And then when Alexander the Great conquered the world, what he did, he, he said, Greek culture is superior. And Greek culture is what everybody should have. Everybody should speak Greek and then become uh, Greek in their culture. Hellenistic is what the, the term was. And so there were Hellenistic Jews and Hellenistic Egyptians and Hellenistic you know, uh, people from Asia Minor and Hellenistic Persians and Hell because Alexander the Great wanted this one world that had this uniformity of Hellenistic culture. And the problem with that is it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So the Greeks had two kinds of people. They had Greeks and barbarians. That's what they said, Greeks and barbarians. And then Christ comes and he unites. In fact, if you look at Jesus' ministry, one of the reasons the people at Nazareth wanted to stone him is because he broke with cultural norms and he included broken people into the gathering of God. He said, wasn't there enough widows in Israel that the prophet didn't have to go to a woman, a, a widow in Sidon and minister to her? Wasn't there enough lepers in Israel that God didn't have to go to an Assyrian named Nathan, that Elisha would heal of leprosy. And when he said that, the people lost their minds because they were so racist. And I think about us today. One of the great demons in the church today is racism or elitism or entitlement. That we think somehow we're better than everybody else. Now, we obviously don't blow our horn for that. We just act that way. We don't act like, you know, it's not obvious but we kind of feel that way. Like we are better than the broken people of the world because we are Christians. And really, in realization, we're just beggars who found bread. We're sinners saved by grace. We've been brought into the family of God, not by our own merit or our good deeds, but by the gracious mercy of God. And he wants to do that to everybody, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their education, regardless of their football allegiance. He wants to bring them into family. Now, this is what he says in Ephesians 2, 15. Let me read, and I want to pull it apart just a bit. And he, made, and he, that's Jesus, made of no effect the law, consisting of commands and expressions and regulations, so that he might create in himself a new man from the two. But what was he talking about, Paul? He was talking about Jews and Greeks, Greeks and barbarians, um, Southerners and Northerners, Blacks and whites, Hispanics and Asians. God doesn't care what ethnicity we are. In fact, God is not colorblind. He loves color. And he created the ethnicity of the world intentionally. He did that intentionally, that he might bring all men to us. So he might do this to bring the two in, into one. And God did this so he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. What? 
Through the cross, the hostility of ethnic diversity is done. It's put to death. That's what God did through the cross. He reconciled man to God and man to man. Oh, he came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. It's the reconciliation of peace. You were far away. He's talking to the Greeks there. You were far away from God in your Hellenistic culture. To the Jews, you were close to God because you had the Mosaic Law and you had the understanding of the historicity of, of, of God and the Messianic promises. But both of you were broken. And he brought you together. Oh, whether you were far away or close, you were broken. For through him, we both have access to one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens in the saints and members of God's own household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building, being put together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. What he's giving here is a clear Understanding, we call it theologically Christology, that Christ is the great uniner. That when we were far away from God, or maybe you kind of knew about God. Now let me talk to you about that for a second. Maybe you grew up in the church, and you had churchianity. And you kind of knew when to stand up, and you knew the words to the songs, and you could quote scripture, and you could sing the Sunday school songs or whatever. But you didn't know Jesus. You knew of him, but you didn't know him. You had not committed yourself to him. And I want to tell you something. Very honestly, that's the most dangerous place you could be, to know about Jesus but never give in your heart to him. Billy Graham says about 80% of people in church today are like that. That's what he said. He doesn't say it anymore because he's like with the Lord. But that's it. And then he said those who are far away who have no clue about spiritual things. Christ came to reconcile us. But it's not just the reconciliation that we would be one body he takes all the broken people and he brings them together so that we might be, this is what Paul says, one body, a holy temple for the Lord. That we live literally all for Jesus. I know you guys probably get weary of some of the Weatherfordisms I throw out. But I want to tell you one that will never get old or I'll never stop saying is that we live all for Jesus. Now I want you to talk about this in your group. How is God reconciled us to himself, and how do we reconcile each other? And how can a broken people become a great body, a temple for the Lord? And we'll talk about it. What is that? How do we live that out? You see, because this theology of reconciliation starts changing our lives, because he takes dumpster fires like you and me, and he uses them to eliminate the world, illuminate the world so that we might live all for Jesus together. So have a great discussion, and I hope this helps.